Hello, welcome to our online panel event, Navigating External Expectations with Young Onset Parkinson's. Um, today's um, event is being brought to you by Parkinson's Community Los Angeles. And we are very fortunate to have with us Miguel Sanchez, Nathan Ward, and Patrice Rifkind to be our fellow panel participants who will be sharing their life and insights of how they live with young onset Parkinson's disease. Um, PCLA is a nonprofit organization that supports families living with Parkinson's. We do free education programs, free support groups, um, online and in-person groups, one in-person group or two, and social events as well. And let me introduce our panel. We have we were supposed to have Jennifer Parkinson Ilgen here today, but she got sick, and so she is not going to be with us today. But we still have some amazing other people. We have Miguel Sanchez. He worked as an aviation electrician for the Coast Guard in his 20s and was honorably discharged in 1992. He then worked as a film and TV lighting technician before taking an early retirement in 2015 five years after his diagnosis. He loves spending time with family, taking road trips, storytelling, reading, writing, and photography. Welcome, Miguel. And we have Nathan. <laughs> He's a 38-year-old husband and father of two. At the age of 26, after being diagnosed with PD, he went into years of depression and decline. Since 2017, his mission has been to help himself and others live think and move well with this disease. He serves as a lead trainer at Motivational USA, drawing from skills he picked up as a lifelong athlete, former 911 dispatcher, and an ex exercise pro with PD to empathetically aid clients in rediscovering vigor for life. Oh, I love that. And then we also have Patrice Rifkind, um, she worked as an audiologist for many years, retiring at 60 due to her increasing p symptoms of PD. She lives in Santa Rosa, California with her husband, Ken, to be closer to her family. She exercises almost daily, serves as a PD mentor, and participates in several support groups to help others stay active. So thank you all for being our panelists today. I'd like to start out with um, Nathan because he seems to be our the youngest one who was diagnosed at 26. And why don't you tell us a little bit of your story, Nathan, about, uh, okay, we know how old you were when you got it, but what your situation was like and how your diagnosis affected you. Was it an easy diagnosis? Did it take a long time to get diagnosed? And um, anything else you wanna add there? All right. Well, thank you for uh, having me, first of all, Nessa, and um, thanks for the introduction. Um, I, so like she said, guys, I was 26 when I was diagnosed. Um, and for your question of how did I go about the diagnosis, um, I was, as you mentioned, a 911 dispatcher. So um, my dexterity in my hands, I was very aware of. So when it started to, when I started to have troubles with typing, um, that was kind of my first signal and it, it was always along the lines of when calls were way more stressful so I knew that there was a little bit of a stress element at that point um, when I went to the neurologist uh, of course uh, they just assumed at my age it was general anxiety and we treated it along those lines but none of the remedies helped um, I always had this internal feeling of uh, unease uh, which I know now is akathisia which uh, is a very unknown symptom of Parkinson's but it can be if you notice it one of the uh, early uh, things that can lead to diagnosis. Um, and your other question of how it affected me, of course, my role in life was serving people. Um, and I, I went to to work every day with vigor, just uh, knowing that I was doing good in my community. And for something outside of my control to rip that away, it was very uh, um, disorienting is the word that I like to use for it. Um, so it took me a period of years to really get back to that uh, point where I felt like I was productive again within life. Um, so I spent a lot of, like you said in my introduction years in depression and climbing out of that, I learned a lot. Um, I in no way profess to have all the answers, but I have learned a lot about myself that I like to share with others. So that's what brings me to this group. So thank you very much for having me. Oh, great. Thank you. 
Uh, how about um, Miguel? Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got diagnosed and how it affected you at first and what your challenges were? Well, I was working as a uh, assistant chief lighting technician um, on a TV show called Brothers and Sisters with a my boss was Willie Dawkins, who's one of the best uh, chief lighting technicians in the industry. And um, I got diagnosed. I was having, well, first of all, I was having problems walking and I thought I needed to see a podiatrist and get inserts and, uh, you know, adjust my feet. And then I was holding, protecting my arm, carrying it like bone apart and, and walking around. People were like, why are you favoring that arm? I, I don't know. I didn't even know I was doing it. And I also noticed I couldn't move fast enough to load, like loading trucks and gear by yourself. I just wasn't, I couldn't move fast. And I also could never recover after on a, on a weekend, I was so sore and achy. I was in bed all weekend and just sleep and rest was never enough. It took two years and a bunch of false diagnoses of, if I had cubital tunnel syndrome, they thought I needed a podiatrist, thought it was arthritis, they thought this and that. And finally I walked into a, they sent me to a neurologist and the guy looked at me and he said, you got Parkinson's. And he handed me a DVD that says life with Parkinson's. It had a cartoon family on the front of it. Oh God. <laughs> some packs of Mirapex and said, see ya. Wow. Anytime going, well, what do you think about the diagnosis? Do you need to, what do you need to know? And all that stuff I had found out on my own. Slowly. And I, I like you, um, Nate went through a bout of depression for quite a while and uh, I didn't tell anybody at first and I told my boss, we kept it quiet. And then we told the crew and the crew kept it quiet and finally told production and they, everybody was fine with it, but we just kind of steadily released the information. And I worked for five years since the diagnosis, but it just got increasingly difficult to do my job, which was a really physical job and it lasted um, you know, 12 plus hours a day. I just couldn't couldn't do it anymore and it also wasn't safe it was I was completely unsafe climbing up on ladders and doing all kinds of things that I should not be doing with you know not the muscle set or or balance that I had before um okay. and finally I just uh I quit I had to quit yeah and then it's a whole new way of life learning how to live uh post working too. If I nod my head a lot, it's because I'm agreeing with like everything you're saying. I know that my husband went through a lot of the same things, was in denial for the first good five years of it, at least for sure. And just had me like looking everything up to learn about it. And then I would tell him. Um, so it seems like that's a, quite a common thing and, and uh, maybe a necessary thing as well, just to give yourself time to learn to deal with it. Patrice. Yes. Can you give us some input as to how it was for you? Well, um, I was working at the, at, you know, when I was, um, I had a company, an uh, audiology company, and uh, I, I enjoyed my work and that part was good, but I started having, the first thing was a problem with my shoe. And it was, it was my left shoe and the sh bottom of the shoe started to wear out because I was pressing on it so hard. And being, uh, having a newer uh, business, I had gone off on my own. Um, I had to do a lot of networking and, and stand around for long periods of time and standing around makes it worse. So um, like uh, I think Nathan said, um, I was depressed at first, but, and, and before I had been diagnosed, I was also see, saw several ENTs, or not ENTs, <laughs> neurologists. Neurology. Yeah. And um, got a couple of uh, false diagnoses and Treat, you know, I had, took Xanax for a while thinking it was a, a stress thing and, and um, went through my fifth neurologist finally told me for sure. And um, being a woman at, you know, up around the age of 50 at that time, um, I, had, um, I had no idea that this was going to happen to me. And I'd been one of those people that's been kind of lucky and everything went well throughout my life. And um, most of it anyway. And um, so I cried for a year and then you have to get back on the horse and keep going. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so I, I retired after 10 years of that, of doing, I didn't tell my patients at all. 
because I, I didn't want them to judge me based on whether or not, you know, was I a good doctor or was I, you know, was I going to get worse and worse and not be their doctor. So, um, so anyway, um, I kept that secret there, but, it, but other people knew and it was, you know, people it is what it is. Huh? Yeah. People that needed to know knew. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I did a part of the reason I also did leave is because, um, I would get home at 10 o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night. And I wasn't going to uh, exercise then. And I didn't feel well in the morning. <laughs> so uh, right. that's another reason I, I wanted to take better care of myself. I get it for sure. Um, I know that, you know, with my husband's diagnosis, they kept sending him to orthopedic doctors because <laughs> he was dragging a leg and also did not have an arm that moved when he walked. Uh -huh. um, but you know, the orthopedics like, oh, stop working out because my husband go to the gym every day. Stop working out for a while. He did stop working out for a while. Nothing changed. And um, finally, one friend said, you know what? He, he, he did tell him that he was having trouble buttoning his shirts. And he said, uh, you know what? I think you need to see a neurologist and, and not a orthopedic doctor. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the first neurologist, you know, had Mike having everything from, um, mad cow disease to MS to ALS to pretty much everything you can think of. And wasn't until we walked into a movement disorder specialist office that he looked at him and pretty much knew right away what was going on. Mm -hmm. And then it's a matter of, uh, yeah, figuring out who to tell and who not to tell. Um, and I think like one thing that happened with Mike, um, is that I really felt like we should tell people what was going on because the thing I was thinking that the things that they thought might be wrong with him could be way worse than Parkinson's. So, you know, he was sweating a lot at the time. He was having a lot of movements. And, and to me, it kind of looked like he was um, a drug addict um, or an alcoholic in need of a fix. And so it was better to tell people the truth Mm -hmm. then have them try and guess what it was mm -hmm. um that's again, an interesting that, that's an interesting thing you said because i i told people the truth but they unfortunately because i was so young assumed the opposite uh yeah oh. <laughs> see that. wow yeah and, well because also for young onset people i mean that even doctors don't want to believe that you can have parkinson's at that age so, and i think that's why it takes so long to get diagnosed is because they don't want you to have it yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, absolutely. I was diagnosed, like you guys said, wrong diagnosis. I was diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome before uh -huh. Parkinson's, believe it or not, um, uh -huh. which was a false diagnosis. Um, I do swear a lot, but I can control <laughs> it. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's interesting that you guys say that you had false diagnosis beforehand too. And I find that that's um, common, but I wanted to note something since we've got a doctor on our panel, we should say that any doctor that can sort this out is kind of a superstar because this is all difficult stuff for us to even be able to figure it out ourselves, but then to ask somebody else to observe us enough to figure that out, it's difficult. So there has to be that caveat as well. If you hear hoofbeats, think of horses, not zebras. And cause a lot of medical students and will think of zebras every time, you know, and so Parkinson's, especially, you, how old were you? I was 26. 26. That's, yeah, that's young. Um, and so you, you know, they don't think at 26 that you could possibly, or for that matter, in my, my, um, my doctors too. I mean, people still ask, doubt that I have it. Yeah, I, I should say, you know, the I think the only reason I knew at that age that I even had it was because I was a 9 dispatcher, because I was so focused mm -hmm. on how my typing affected and if the timing was off, if I didn't get the call in time, what effect that had on my caller. So I was very aware of very minute changes to my typing. And I think that's really what drove the early diagnosis. So I, I, and it, it sucks that I've got Parkinson's, but I'm lucky it, as far as the rest of the community. I'm very lucky that I was in that field and able to be aware of it so early. That's great. Our kids, when Mike was diagnosed, we had children, we had three sons who were ages two, six, and eight. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you guys had have kids, um, and um, Nathan, especially you being so young, were you married at the time? And Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, uh, I'm married to my uh, high school sweetheart, been with her since I was 16. 
Um, and we got married when we were 21. Uh, I was diagnosed at 26. My first son was born when I was 24. So um, I have a 15 year old currently and a six year old. So I was just actually saying this, that um, it's something that's not really looked at with young onset is um, the children, because later onset, you're looking at children that are sometimes 30s and 40s before their parents are diagnosed. But this is all my children have ever known. And that's right. a completely different aspect for them, much larger even than young onset to older onset is the difference in the children. Their their lives are at way different stages at diagnosis. So I think the, the age at diagnosis actually has a greater impact on our children than it does us. Yeah. And it's really hard to explain to kids in an age appropriate way uh, you know, that you have brain damage from, you know, the disease. Um, um, I think our kids just kind of picked it up as we went along. The older kids um, were able to have dad as their basketball coach, whereas my youngest son wasn't because by then he was just too dyskinetic and too, his symptoms were, um, you know, pretty noticeable and he didn't want to be down there coaching kids. That's so. Okay. Can I interrupt you there? Because I, yeah. I, I, since we're on this panel, I'm going to get a little bit hurt. I, I actually had a conversation with my 15 year old last night. Mm -hmm. and I, I laid out a lot of things that I, I know I'm not necessarily going to be able to teach my eight year old because I'm going to progress between the ages of my 15 year old, and my eight year old getting to 15. So I had to have that conversation with him and it took me a while to really build up and say, okay, this is how I'm going to approach this because I don't want him to worry. But at the same point, I need him to know that all of these things I've been building into you, I need you to unfortunately son step up and then pass them along to your younger brother, because I'm not going to have the same capability at that time. Um, and he was very receptive to it. Um, as surprising as that was, I was very scared thinking that it was going to turn him into a little bit of a fear state, but it didn't. I think he really understood and he was appreciative that I was respectful enough of my own son to give him that role and ask him to help me. And the, the whole topic we're talking about is external expectations. I think sometimes they can be a little bit different than what we even view them as when we get a little deeper into that topic. Yeah. Um, you know what? I have something just along the lines of what you said is my husband was able to coach my two older sons in basketball, but my youngest not. But my oldest son stepped in and coached my youngest son's basketball. So the kids are really, you know, I think um, when kids face something like that, they learn how to be a little bit more empathetic and caring to anybody in the world. I mean, if my kids walk up and see somebody struggling with the door, they're gonna run and open the door for a person. And that's that kind of empathy and caring for the world around you isn't always easy to teach. But when you have it in the home, um, I think, you know, it 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 sends that message. Um, yeah, great point. Unless they're in their 20s. <laughs> Well, you know, my so kid, I have kids in my 20s now. Yeah. And my, kids, my youngest son is 25. And I just had to have kind of a heart to heart with them the other day about how this is a progressive disease because they forget. They get used to seeing you at one period in time. Mm -hmm. But I did tell them I had to remind them it's a progressive disease and you keep up with it as much as you can. Exercise, taking your meds, all of that. Um, but, you know, that this is the truth. This is the reality. And he now, cried. So can I can I flip this around a little bit? Because I, I actually know Miguel a little bit. We're friends. Um oh, and he's, he's got a little bit of the reverse side going where you know he's he's a caregiver to his own father and his father's watching him go through the progression. Miguel, can you kind of talk to us a little bit about that aspect of things? Well, I wanted to just interject first about my son, who uh has not lived with me since he was two years old and he's lived with his mom in Florida. Um and he was, you know, um 15 16 when he found out he's now 35 and his mom has alzheimer's mm. mom and dad have the number one number two degenerative brain diseases in the world mm. and uh he can't even talk about his mom mm. um and the, the thing nate you're talking about me and my dad my dad actually takes care of me more than i take care of him oh, he's better i, I love i love that you say that <laughs> does he's a he's a pretty he's a really great guy he's a pretty amazing um man uh, thank you dad 
90 it'll be 92 in december oh wow yeah. that's awesome i mean it can really bring you closer together as a family if Grandson. if you invite that and mm -hmm. if you allow people to help you i think that's one of the hardest things that young people with parkinsons um have to deal with is is accepting help and um, I'll let, I'm going to let you guys tell me about a couple of situations maybe where you've had that, but let me throw one out there. I know when my husband used to do some grocery shopping and the people who work there, you know, can I help you to the car? Can I put this in your bag for you? And at first he was like, no, no, because you know, I'm, I, I don't want you to think anything's wrong with me. But after a while, he just, he said, yes, you can help me. Yes. You can walk me to the car. You can put the groceries in the back of my car. And you know what? You find that people are really happy that they can do something nice for you. And it's almost a gift that you can give to them. Um, I know I feel better when I'm doing something nice for someone else. So um, do any of you have some um, issues where you were, it was hard to ask for help? Um, and how did you go about uh, dealing with that? <laughs> Always. David? Always, okay. <laughs> Always hard to ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. I try not to go ahead. I, I try I try not to overdo that. Like, can I can I get the top off that bottle? <laughs> I'm I've been going to get to the little rubber thing that helps you <laughs> to do it instead of uh always asking my husband. Um but uh we've had some issues because we have and uh, the grandbaby is our our son's wife had you know had the baby. And that's why we moved up in this area. We had been in Los Angeles area before. Um, so basically, uh, I, I didn't realize that her knowing that I had Parkinson's that she decided that I wasn't capable of standing up and holding the baby. And maybe she's just super overprotective right now because the baby's only four months old, but that just killed me. That was really tough. <laughs> and I can tell you that my husband could not stand and hold the baby right now. He would have to sit and hold the baby. So, you know, well, people I would have to be educated that there's yeah. all different stages of Parkinson's mm -hmm. and things that you can do great for 20 years and other things that might be more difficult. Might be able to walk with the baby, but standing still might be hard because mm -hmm. standing still is hard for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it's the rough so, out. It's difficult for me. What is rough housing with my grandson oh. is difficult to do. Yeah. They're, they're tough, aren't they? Those little squirts. They're really tough. They got a lot of strength and a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they also can bring a lot of happiness and joy, your oh, grandchildren yeah. and your regular children too. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> my kids all wrote their college essays about their dad having Parkinson's. So that they, we use the part, we pull the Parkinson's card when it's necessary. Oh, I forgot to sign up for basketball. Oh, my dad had brain surgery that day. You know, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Patrice, I, I wanted to mention based on what you said, how, how different experiences with Parkinson's can be based on who you are and your perceptions and your own desires. Mm -hmm. um, you as, you know, somebody who wants to hold that baby, you, you, you desire that and your Parkinson's takes that away from you. Me, I know, I don't really want to hold the baby. I'm a little bit terrified in the first place. Um, I've got two of my own. I held them. But when it comes to my nieces and nephews, I've actually had people take offense that I decline. Whoa. And it's from it's actually from the worry that I'm going to have a dyskinesia or something's going to happen and it, topple. And I, I don't want that. And it, I don't have the same desire as maybe some women do to actually hold that baby and have that feeling, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's crazy how much different Parkinson's can be from man to woman and person to person. I just wanted to kind of highlight that, how that situation is different for me. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And I think that's where communication mm -hmm. is key so mm -hmm. that you can say to your daughter-in-law, I know you might be worried about me holding the baby. Is that something you're worried about? And let me tell you, you know, what I'm able and what I'm not able to do. So mm -hmm. communicating with people is super important. And that's how they can kind of keep up with what you're doing right. Uh, I mean, what you're, what you're um, capable of doing easily, what you might need some help with. Um, 
I know one thing you all, we all kind of talked about was when you first found out that you, you got depressed, mm -hmm. uh, which is not just because I had Parkinson's, it's actually a part of the disease that you can get depressed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, having a positive attitude in your <laughs> life mm -hmm. uh, really makes a huge difference in how you deal with your disease. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll throw out, for example, that my husband does a gratitude list every night. And sometimes oh. the things that he's grateful for are, I'm glad I wasn't as bad today as I was yesterday or something like that. But he can always find something. What have you guys done to keep stay positive and not to let um, the depression and the, you know, the dark side of things take over. Um, Try to have good thoughts on going to bed and waking up. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't go read the newspaper right away. When you get up out of bed, that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and just think nice thoughts about your friends and family and things that you've done that you, that you enjoy or things that you saw that gave you joy during the day helps to go to bed also mm -hmm. breathing and meditating before going to bed and waking up is also really helpful stay positive great and how about um you patrice what do you going, do to stay positive? going out for a walk uh, I, I live in an area with lots of trees and and it's it's, it's a real uh wild turkeys running all over the place and yeah. and uh deer and you know other animals and it, it, you know, getting out there and getting my legs to really swing, I try to, you know, do a, a really wide, wide uh, stance helps me feel better. Mm -hmm. You know, it helps, helps the medicine kick in. <laughs> so nature and exercise mm -hmm. sounds like what, what helps you. Yeah. And um, Nathan, how about you? Well, I, I struggled with apathy for period of years and to pull myself out for myself was the struggle that I couldn't overcome. I, I, I was just too deep into it. So I really had to pin my own um, desires and uh, my own goals on how I could help other people. Mm -hmm. And that has been my hack to, to apathy. And really that's what drives the business that I do is that I'm helping other people and that within my own Parkinson's allows me an escape and I get paid for it. So that's cool too, but it's really just helping other people is really what, what gets me going. Yeah. yeah that's, a good thing. that's great. I agree with that a hundred percent. Sometimes yeah. I don't feel like running a support group, but I always feel better after I have. Yeah. Um, I like, I like helping other people too. And, and, you don't say, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I'm not an MD. I'm a, a audiologist, which is a, a like a practice, like a practicing like, optometrist versus a ophthalmologist. All of those, right, right? A different person who helps people. Yeah, exactly. And okay. but, but I can't do that anymore. Really, I'm not working anymore for that. But I do help that's, that's, everybody that's that I. What. I don't mean to keep interrupting. I'm sorry. That's my okay. worst. Habit. That that's what I'm getting at is uh, losing that. When I was an yeah. iron dispatcher, that was my role in life was helping yeah. people. So exactly. losing that to Parkinson's that exactly. caused those years of apathy, and I had to find some way to pin it back on. I've got to provide some service to people, yeah. and I think that that's an, a, a kind of a lost art within our community. We we look at oh, what can we do for ourselves? We got to go and do all of this cardio for ourselves. Well, you know, you can do a lot of cardio while helping other people, and then you don't even have to think about the exercise. So that's, that's my, my preferred hack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I find myself, I mean, if I go to a picnic or dinner or something like that, and I start talking to people at the table, I'll find out uh, that, that, you know, people have a lot of questions that they find out you're an audiologist. And so then I feel like I'm, I'm doing, you know, something good. Mm -hmm. Or if they have a family member with uh, Parkinson's, we go on and on about it. So um it Hey, Doc, as long as people are listening, you will always have something to say to them. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. If they make it a little bit of an audiologist. Say. So I'm curious oh. about um, assistive devices that you guys may use um, and how you feel about them. Um, you know, whether it's a walker or whether it's grab bars or a heightened, um, uh, your, your, uh, your toilet is raised up. Um, things of that sort. I think that it, it's been kind of my view that it, the younger the person, the harder it is to use an assistive device. But I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say about that. Well, I moved into a house that had a grab bar in the shower and I didn't complain. 
<laughs> and tell them to take it out. I have, I, I, oh, I have an elevator. Actually, I have a little lift that we put oh, in. Don't really need it yet, um, but it's it's nice to have it there. And if I had, do have to carry something upstairs, then then I have the lift to take me up. Or so. you can put the package in the lift and walk up alongside it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have an interesting uh, one with this because it, it ties into managing external expectations really well too, because I, I used a cane, um, but not really for balance issues so much as just freezing where I, I would use it as an external cue to really to get it. So I ended up carrying the cane around a lot. Mm -hmm. And as a young person, first of all, the fact that you've got the cane, people are looking at you like, what are you doing with that cane? And then you're walking normal most of the time. And every once in a while, you're just kind of tapping in front of you. And then you start walking. People don't have the slightest clue what the heck you're doing or what you're struggling through. So the, the managing those external expectations, people expect you to be normal and not walk around with a cane and tap it in front of you in order to be able to walk. And they're never going to take the time to actually research why you're doing it or what it is that you're going through. So in, that state to use an assistive device like you said as a younger person it's more difficult yeah because you're managing external expectations at the same time which those expectations are if you never never need that dang device especially in the mode that sometimes parkinson's requires us to use it because sometimes it's not used as a normal you know crutch device but as a cue device so mm -hmm. um it's interesting. But then on the on the back side of that, I, I started training in karate um, and martial arts, and I started to internalize a lot of the cues that I was using the cane for. So I, I overcame the need for it. Um, but it, during that period of my life, I received a lot of judgment. And it was it was odd. For, I didn't understand why I was receiving the judgment. It took years before I could look back on it and say, Oh, they just didn't understand what was going on with me. Um, interesting question, though. That's a good one. I think, you know, if you're in a crowded space, let's say you're at a Sunday farmer's market and um, typically people with Parkinson's do not do well in crowds. If you have a cane in a situation like that, I think it does give people like, they give you a little more space and move around you a little bit. So mm -hmm. in that sense, um, sometimes in, in crowds, assistive devices, can just make it easier for you. Uh, so people will get out of your way a little bit. Mm -hmm. I agree. The only assisted device I'm using at this moment is, is dictation on. Uh, oh yeah. I did that too. The Mac or the iOS. Mm -hmm. It's really horrible, but it helps a lot at times. And it makes me be more intentional with my speech too. <laughs> It does. Mm -hmm. It forces yes. you to slow down and be very intentional and enunciate every word. Yeah. Otherwise, you wanna or you gonna. <laughs> Miguel, when you when you uh, mentioned that, it actually made me think about a topic that we were talking about earlier, which was allowing other people to help us. And your 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 career path that you had, you had to have literally probably thousands of people helping you on any daily basis so as parkinson's progressed how, how and i know you you kind of highlighted how you tailed off in your career but how did that impact you trying to allow people to continue your career for you, you does that make sense the question um, well, like my crew would see me pushing carts and be like get away from that we got that <laughs> how'd that how'd that feel that uh, to Funny, me i don't want to shove them back out of the way and say no you don't i got this you know well, I would do things. They'd be like, do you need help with that? Rigging that that, that lift with lights? And I'm like, no, I don't need any help. And they'd come back and go, my name is Sanchez and I need no help. And then <laughs> As you're still doing it, trying to finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my job. I was very, very helpful and supportive. I couldn't have done anything. I couldn't have lasted as long as I did if it wasn't for my crew. Yeah, I figured that you may have a good story on allowing people to help you. You wouldn't have lasted as long in that in that job if you couldn't. No, you're absolutely right. That's very observant of you. Astute. Oh, in had... addition to assistive devices, there's also you were a healthy person before you got diagnosed, and all of a sudden you're faced with all these different medications that people want you to take. And right. a lot of people don't like that. They don't want to take medications. Um, I'll take them later. You know, I don't want to take them now. Um, but I always, my, my, um, view is that you want to live your best quality of life right now in the moment. So if the meds are going to help you feel better then that you should take them and not think about what they're going to do to you down the line. But how, how was that for you guys? Um, can starting I, out can I yes. finish the last topic real quick? Sure, so sure. this is what I did for my life is th these are hearing aids and you uh -huh. 
plug these in here and you have to push on it and, <laughs> and then you have to put this little wire so that it gets stays in the right place in your ear in little domes and I started having a lot of trouble with those and you don't say <laughs> we <laughs> luckily we I, I was smart enough to train some techs how to do those and I started asking for a lot of help and um, I think they were a little annoyed at having to help me in addition to doing their work but my dad refuses to wear those. Oh, does he? <laughs> yeah. it, it's linked with uh, dementia. So it is, it is linked with and cognition issues too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But again, it's assistive device. I don't need help. I don't need help. But, yeah. you know, the reality is, um, you know, especially with the thing with Parkinson's is you don't necessarily have hearing issues, but your voice can get soft and change the tone of your voice, whereas others may not be able to hear you as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's really hard as a person with Parkinson's when somebody says to you all the time, what, what, what? I know I do it to my husband. How do you, do you guys have had you face challenges with your voice? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Absolutely. I, my, death and my voice is low. So he forces me to enunciate and shout louder. I have to talk big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've been taking speech therapy for about a year. That's very yeah. good. Cal State LA. They're really good. That's I, 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 inst I instruct uh, yeah. martial arts classes during the week and um, I'm, I'm training for a new certification and my uh, feedback last night from my instructor was that I needed to be louder. It's always the, I need to be louder. I, I feel like I'm screaming half the time during the classes, but it's not that, that case. And I, I literally, I sing every day for about a half hour, at least sometimes more when I'm saying I sing, I'm screaming like at the top of my lungs, my neighbors probably hate me just trying to open up my voice. So I work at it and it's still diminishing. And I still don't notice when I'm being quiet. What about using a microphone? Our, my exercise teacher uses one. Oh, during, during the classes. That's yeah. a great idea. So I'm, I'm actually uh, looking to open my own karate school and I may actually implement that now that you said it. That's a great <laughs> idea, Patrice. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> but no, in, in the current school, he would probably say, no, you need to speak louder. <laughs> speak louder, push up stronger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. You know, and that's something I worry about with my spouse is how are we going to communicate as time goes on, because speech therapy is not one of the most fun things to do, to sit there at your computer and go, ah, oh, you know, um, singing is much more fun. And I often tell people, maybe read, read out loud is another thing that you can do that you might not feel so silly doing. It's also choral groups. And I took singing lessons for a while. Uh, uh, oh, that's great. I'm a private singing instructor. Only with the hopes of possibly singing "Happy Birthday" in tune. <laughs> My goal, not a very high one, but you know, it just it was it exercised your your whole vocal range, and you learned where to you know to use your voice and how to control the breath. And I think it's worthwhile singing. I think it's a great thing to do. It's yeah. a life saving life saving thing too, because it if you get the the muscles in your throat keep them in good condition you're less likely to have problems later with swallowing with pneumonia <laughs> yeah yes exactly oh, pneumonia yeah what else are uh, things that you would might want to share with somebody who was newly diagnosed with young onset what's what's something that you one piece of advice you might want to give someone who's starting out is scared like you were scared and um what what's one you know kind of thought that you would want to share? I would say one, that you should do a lot of research into the disease and learn what it's all about and what the medications are all about. But the danger of doing that is getting sucked into these rabbit holes. And then you get to you, do I have this? Am I going to have that? And you have to avoid that. But you mm -hmm. should find out and learn, educate yourself as much as you can about the disease, your symptoms and the medications you're taking and what problems those do. And anytime you get a new medication, you should also just look it up on your own. Don't just take the doctor or pharmacist's word on it because sometimes a economy is not like, pay attention that this doesn't have, doesn't contraindicate well with this medication. Yeah. You know, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And if you're concerned about your body and your health, which I've become uber that since I've got Parkinson's, I start paying attention to all those little things and, and I want to be educated so I can talk to my doctor 
in an informed way about what it is I have or I'm feeling. Uh -huh. Great. How about you, Nathan? What would you share with somebody newly diagnosed? Um, on on the topic of managing external expectations, I I would I would say that I want you to maintain your personal autonomy. Uh, I would say that your your expectations of other people's are all, uh, of other people are always going to be different than what their actual circumstances are. So managing your perceived expectations versus real expectations is a huge thing within Parkinson's, and it goes back to the first. Um, inclination that a lot of our neurologists have that we just have anxiety. Well, no, that's definitely a huge part of this. And it's not the only one, unfortunately, but it exacerbates everything else. So managing that first part, that anxiety that's caused by what we expect out of others or what we expect them to think. A lot of times we can just throw that out because our, our thoughts on it are usually completely off. And that's what I would tell other people is you're going to go through a lot of changes and you're going to wonder what other people are thinking. And you may actually assign some truths to that that aren't really truth. So I would really caution on thinking too deeply on what other people are thinking. And when it comes to managing external expectations, it's actually that you need to manage your internal expectations and, and focus on those more than anything. And I would say that that's what I would tell somebody newly diagnosed. Good. Patrice, what are your thoughts? Um, I wish I got my kids more believing that I have a problem mm. and I'm, and now, I mean, I mean, being a little more visible about forgetting my train of thought, um, you know, losing a word and I can't think of it and it drives me crazy. And, and, um, and my husband will say, well, yeah, but we're both getting older. Well, yeah, but it's, it, it's not, it's not at the normal level, you know? And, um, I would say, uh, I would have started exercising a lot more the first 10 years. Yes. I think it would have helped. Yes. And um, right. same. And awesome. get organized with your meds as they as you add to them. Because um, I, I have a whole system on Sunday where I can go through and put them in their little boxes. And, and that way I can just take them on my phone. But today I missed my 2.30. <laughs> Something was going on and I, I clicked on it and didn't, didn't take my 2.30. Oh, I see uh, Christopher <laughs> Jones put something in the chat about um, sometimes when you go to the pharmacy to pick up your medications, it looks different because you maybe got a different generic version of your carbidopa levodopa. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people who that slight difference from a different manufacturer really affects their Parkinson's. And this was something I learned from doing support groups. And then everybody would just go to the pharmacy that had the, the generic version that they like the best. So you really can be affected by a different version of a generic. And you do, you know, you do have to watch. And, and when you add medications, only add one at a time so that you can see, you know, what's going on. If you change too many things at once, you'll never know um, what's causing your problems. But I agree 100% with um, the generics can be different from place to place. Um, I think that's that's very true. Um, and can sometimes some pharmacies will only supply one generic version. If you don't mm -hmm. like that one, you need to pick up and find another pharmacy um, that carries the one that works better for you. And people wouldn't think that because you think it's gonna be the same. Oh, and the switch made somebody else sick. Yeah, I mean, really, when you look at your pills and they look different, first of all, then look at the bottle and make sure they gave you the right medication. And then, you know, look up the picture. And if it is affecting you differently, then, you know, find uh, the one that you liked better before and keep looking until you find that. I've That's actually had an allergic different. reaction to a generic. So you can't tell me that the um, actual ingredients aren't different because from a regular um, first class drug to a generic, I had an allergic reaction to the generic, but I go back to the original and I don't have that allergic reaction. And, and even within generics, they have feedback, several, but... several different factories that are making it. I, right. I, had, I had a bone shaped pill that was easy to find, you know, it was a long white, white pill, but it was, had a, a bone you know, a, a kind of a dent in the middle and I couldn't get it again. 
and it was and it was part of my part of my whole routine of putting them together you'd have to look at them and make sure you see all the you know you didn't forget where's them. my bone shaped pill yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> and it was gone and they right. and they refused to uh to make that change for me right i know there's it's like you know 85 percent of a generic has to be the same but you know and i don't know that that's the exact amount but yeah, generics can definitely be different from one to another. What about being going to people's houses um, and socializing? Is there any, you know, like, you know, my husband spills a lot. I have cups with tops. But so sometimes when we go to other people's houses and you don't know what their bathroom looks like or you don't know whether it's an open layout or a closed layout, sometimes that can cause some anxiety to going to other people's houses and, and being social. Does that happen to you guys? For me, it's more about on and off periods coming up while you're visiting somebody and just letting like letting people know that I may cut out early because I'm having a really bad off period and I don't feel like sharing it with you publicly because mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable. Or if it's somebody you're comfortable with and you can do that, that's another story. But everybody's different and everybody, you know, and every off period is different. But I allow myself an exit. Every time I, I tell people I'm going that I'm going to have dinner with, I said I may have to get up and leave in the middle of this for second bite of dessert or whatever, you know. Um, Makes me think what I'm going to order at a restaurant yeah. because that's going to be harder to eat, and I'm going to probably be dribbling some of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. You no know? rice, no salad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rice is definitely no. Yeah. Um, you're eating it with a spoon. Rice oh, works yes. pretty well with a spoon. Yeah. Right. Definitely. My husband prefers a spoon, although I don't know if any of you have ever tried eating ice cream with a fork. He finds eating ice cream with a fork much easier than a spoon. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Try it sometime. <laughs> you might be surprised. Um, I know my husband has stuff, you know, concerns about that, too. So I may be more inclined to invite people to my house so that we stay social and that we don't isolate and that we maintain connections. Because I know at my house that my husband is going to be most comfortable. So I may not always want to entertain, but in order to stay social, um, you know, I will have people over to my house a lot more often than, um, you know, I'll be going to other people's. And I can make it easy. I can order out food. I don't have to cook everything. Nobody has to do that. But it's just another way of staying social. Um, in staying in a comfort, you know, being comfortable as well. Nathan commented about the cane to help with freezing. Any other freezing help secrets? Secrets? Um, um, no, not secrets. Um, it's all in the research, I would say. Uh, I, I would say that there's uh, such thing as internalized cues, uh, which is the, the cane itself is an external cue. Of course, it's something outside of our body that we're utilizing to give ourselves internalized imagery that drives our movement. So we could then create our own internalized imagery, correct? We could imagine something outside of ourselves, just like if we see a laser dot on the floor that drives our movement towards the laser dot, but it doesn't necessarily need to be there. So I guess the secret I would say is that you have all the power within your brain to create those same external cues that we utilize as internal cues where you don't need any of those things. That's one thing that I learned from martial arts once I started practicing that is we utilize a lot of external cues in martial arts, which are perfect for Parkinson's disease. Um, I, I should have said that internal cues. Um, it, it, it becomes kind of confusing is, are you imagining this? Is it real in real life, right? The cane I was holding was real in real life, but I could imagine I'm holding the cane and have the same effect is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So we, we can hack the system in many different ways. And I'll say that, uh, I'm, I'm good at a few different ways, but what I notice when I work with clients is that they're even better at imagining new ways. And as I work with every new client, I find new ways with each one that they've come up with. So that tells me that each one of us has our own secret sauce, our own secret recipe that we just need to experiment and find, right? Like I find I, that stairs are easier because you have the lines of the stairs. And so, yeah, yeah and where you're walking on regular floor I may mean, just like shuffle my feet I know some people will like hum hum or sing a little song to themselves mm -hmm. or count yeah. or or tap their hand against their limb that they want to move you know there's different things that people do like that that's why some walkers will have 
the laser device, like you were saying, Nathan. And they also, some of them have a metronome so that you can get on a pace. So sound cues. To it. Absolutely. Yeah, sound cues, music, rocking side to side. And the other thing is, is you should look at your meds if you're getting stuck a lot. Maybe you need to take um, your meds a little bit closer together, or you might need to add a half a pill, or make, or see if it happens at the same time every day that you freeze. And those are the things you really want to talk to your doctor about. And then they can look at the times when you're having trouble versus when you're taking your medications and maybe offer some guidance on um, maybe moving them closer, taking an extra one. So it's supposed- That's a, that's a great point, Nessa, but it, it requires one thing which we need to kind of preach is journaling. You have to journal these. If you don't have some way of keeping track of your symptomology, you have to be able to do that to provide your doctor some more insight than what you can say in 15 minutes. You, know, you need to be able to provide some documentation. So if you're not journaling your symptoms and those changes that Nessa was talking about, hopefully within this, if you don't take anything else, take that, start journaling so you can give your doctor feedback. Yeah. And journaling may be hard if you can't write, <laughs> but course. again, then we can use um, talking to Siri or, um, you know, something like that. Or because, if you have a Nessa, if you have a Nessa, you can utilize yeah. her, take notes for you. <laughs> I go to my, I go with my husband to all his appointments and the doctor says, oh, are you noticing this, this, or that? He's like, oh no, everything's great. <laughs> and then he looks at me and um, well, he's doing this a lot or this not, a lot. So not so much doc. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it is good to bring somebody to an appointment too. Because I don't think you're always aware of what you're doing yourself. Other people may be more aware of what you're doing. So how about any closing sentiments um, you guys want to share? Like if I were going to share one thing I would say is to learn how to be patient with yourself or with your person with Parkinson's. I think patience is a huge thing. What do you, what do you think, Patrice? Yes, absolutely. And, and, uh, and I've got to work on that with my family. <laughs> Because there hasn't been a lot of patience lately, although my husband's very patient most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes yeah. you just have to say, hey, it takes me a minute to put my shoes on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I wait explain, a minute. I explain what bradykinesia is <laughs> and that kind of thing. I said, right. yeah. Miguel, you have any closing comments you'd like to share with the group? Whatever you're feeling now, you won't be feeling it in a few minutes. But you're going to go through it. You know, you think that the bradykinesia is going to last forever or the dystonia is going to be like, I'm never going to get, it's never going to stop. I'm stuck with it. And then like two or three hours, maybe a half a day later, it goes, it's gone. And you got some other things. Yeah. Now. Sure. Driving right. train, you know, it's a fluctuating disease. The symptoms do not stay the same. Mm -hmm. for all the time. Not, you know, they, they, they vary in intensity and duration and frequency. So. It's true. Right. And uh, one day can be completely different from the next day, yeah. too. Well, um, it helps you accept everything. It helps you accept the situation better to know that these things are going to change. You just have to bear with the moment and find a way through it. And then you'll have to find a way through the next moment. Mm -hmm. Nathan, it's share some inspiration with us. <laughs> yes, no, no, no pressure. Um, <laughs> So I, I uh, what I had prepared is not the most inspirational thing, but hopefully I can twist it that way. So I, I would say that to, to end what I what I really wanted to drive uh, from my time with you guys today was that we, we make sure that um, the stresses that we allow external expectations to cause are not actually driven by shortcomings within our internal expectations. What that means is really holding yourself to your own values, even though we're dealing with this disease, not to let it degrade us to a point where we're not holding ourselves to those same morals and standards that we did our whole lives. Um, and I, I only say that from a point of falling victim to that. So um, that's where I would, I would really want to impact people is that even though other folks uh, may think or view things this way, that you have your own set of standards and holding dear to those is really what's going to guide you through everything that you're going through. Right. Oh, I think that's a comment. I used an Irish blackthorn cane and it helps me because it's a tool of my Irish people. Well, very good. It's, it's a weapon. Be proud. I, I mean, I, I always tell thorn. people, be proud. You didn't do anything wrong to get Parkinson's. It just happened. So um, 
Anyway, so I want to thank uh, PCLA for putting this together today and um, sharing um, knowledge with other people. And I want to thank, uh, let's see, we have, thank our um, panelists for sure. Thank you so much. And we had some sponsors for today's event, uh, Boston Scientific, Acadia, and Abbott. And we have a lot of great events coming up at PCLA. If you enjoyed today's program, please visit PCLA.org and make a donation. By donating to PCLA, you can join us in our mission to improve the lives of families in our communities living with Parkinson's. And you can find our tax deductible information on the bottom of this screen and um, check out PCLA's calendars for other events. And um, I think, I think we're done. Thank you, Nessa. Nice, nice meeting you guys. Thank you all for coming.